yet another wonderful morning for us to be here today. You know, these last few weeks, last few months, Minnesota's been playing with our feelings a little bit. We've got some fall temperatures, and then we've got some temperatures like today that reach almost 100 degrees. And this is when we're thankful to God for AC and uh, when we come to church wearing two or three layers. You know, I observed this over the last couple of weeks, and I thought, a while back, I thought I was a very observant guy. I thought I saw everything around me. I, I thought I saw, I was able to spot things before they happened, spot things that others couldn't spot, and if we played the game Waldo, I thought, finding Waldo, I thought I was the fastest out of everyone who could find him. But all that went away when one day I was looking for my phone, and it turns out it was in my hand the whole time. That was confirmed when one day I was sitting before God and complaining to him about how he doesn't answer my prayers. I was talking to God and I was telling him that it feels like the sky is shut out from me. Telling him that I can't see the work he's doing in my life, in the world around me. Sounds a bit childish and selfish, but that's the reality that I was living in. So today I wanted to look at something similar. Today I wanted to look into scripture from a story, uh, at a story from Jesus' life and ministry. In this story, Jesus interacts with two groups of people, and we'll find out who those groups are when we read it. But in this passage, these groups of people have the same problem. We'll see that problem when we read it too. But before we read... A little background on what's happening. Jesus just finished feeding 4,000 people with seven loaves of bread. This is the second time that he fed a large group. The first time was with 5,000, uh, fed 5,000 people with five loaves of bread. So let's read starting uh, Mark chapter 8, verse 11. And here's what it says. Then the Pharisees came out and began to dispute with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven, testing him. But he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Assuredly, I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. Now, I want to take a little pause here and highlight a, uh, a detail that Mark adds. He said that Jesus sighed deeply in his spirit. Now, I can only imagine that sigh that he had that came from the deepest part of his spirit. He probably thought, when the Pharisees came up, he probably thought, are you serious? Just fed 4,000 people with seven loaves, and you're asking me for a sign. What more do these people need? Continuing on in verse 13, he said, it says, And he left them, and getting into the boat again, departed to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, and they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Then he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have no bread. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, Why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many baskets full of fragments did you take up? They said to him, 12. Also, when I broke seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of fragments did you take up? They said to him, seven. And he said to them, how is it that you do not understand? We've got two groups of people here. You've got the Pharisees and the disciples. They share a similar problem. Their problem is that they're not very observant. They're inattentive. They can't see what Jesus is doing right in front of them. Jesus had proven time and time again that he says he is who he says he is. That he is, in fact, the promised Messiah, the Son of God, the Redeemer of all things. And yet, these two groups had a hard time seeing that. Now, although the Pharisees and Jesus', uh, Jesus disciples had the same problem, they had a different reason behind the problem. Let's first look at the Pharisees. Mark 8, 11. Let's read that passage again. It says, 
Then the Pharisees came out and began to dispute with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven, testing him. So the Pharisees approached Jesus, demanding a sign, that he perform a sign, a miraculous sign, to prove that he says who he is who he says he is. They wanted him to prove his divinity, completely disregarding the many signs that Jesus has already performed to prove and to show that he is the Son of God. In fact, here are some signs that we see in Mark's gospel so far. You've got Jesus healing a leper. Jesus healed a paralytic. He healed a blind guy. He walked on water during a severe storm. He calmed the severe storm by speaking to it. He resurrected a dead girl. He healed a woman with a lifelong ailment. He fed thousands of people by miraculously multiplying small amounts of bread twice. The list can go on and on. And again, the story happens right after Jesus just finished feeding 4,000 people with seven loaves. The Pharisees still had the audacity to come come up to him and ask him for a sign and demand a sign from him. Do you see the ridiculousness of this request? Because Jesus saw it. And he responded with a deep sigh. Mark 12, 8, 12, and 13, it says that he responded with a sign, told them they're not going to get a sign, and he left to the other side. The reason Jesus didn't bother with yet another sign is because he knew what the truth is, and the truth is this. The Pharisees are just unwilling to believe. They don't want to see what Jesus is doing. It's not that Jesus is not doing enough miracles. It's not that he's not doing the right miracles. It's not that his miracles aren't big enough. I mean, five loaves, 5,000 people resurrecting a girl. That's not the problem. The problem is that these people are unwilling, too stubborn, too selfish, too proud to believe. Loving their position, loving their rules, loving what people thought of them, how highly people thought of them as they walked by. If Jesus could have still performed a hundred miracles right in front of them and it wouldn't have mattered because the Pharisees were unwilling. They didn't want to see what was right in front of their eyes. I would argue that this Pharisee problem is still alive, alive and, well to, and well today. I think many people don't believe in Jesus simply because they're unwilling to believe. Lack of evidence of God is merely an excuse. The Bible tells us that people love their sin. The light came into this world, and the world loved the darkness and hated the light. Listen, if you're looking for the evidence of God, look around. Creation screams his glory and his name. It screams, here's your sign. Look at the people. Look at the lives that he's changed. Look into his word. Look around you and you'll see mention of Jesus everywhere. Now, I don't have enough time to go through every aspect of this, but the point is, if you aren't willing to believe, you will overlook and discredit even the most obvious work of God. Do you find yourself doing this? Despite the evidence pointing directly to God, you find yourself overlooking and discrediting that. I'm not here to scold. If you're in that category, all I ask is that you be willing to look and observe. Because if you don't, you may find yourself missing something that's right in front of you and that was right in front of you all along. Now, with all that being said, we still have another group to talk about, Jesus' disciples. Remember, they had the same problem. They had the same problem as the Pharisees, but the, their reasoning was different. They couldn't see what Jesus was doing right in front of them, but they had a different reason. Mark 8, verse 14 Let's get back into that and see what it says. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, and they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. 
Then he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned amongst themselves, saying, It is because we have no bread. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, Why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? After just having told the Pharisees he's not going to give them a sign, Jesus gets into the, into the boat and uses this as a teaching moment for the disciples. He tells them, beware of the corrupt and pervasive teaching of the Pharisees. This is a great teaching moment, a great learning opportunity for the disciples. But all they could think about is how they had no bread. They had one loaf. You read this and you sit back and go, really? He just fed 4,000 with seven loaves and you're worried about bread? I kind of wonder what their thought process was. Feed 5,000 with five loaves? Doable. Feed 4,000 with seven? Yeah, I could see that happening. Feed 12 or 13 with one? No, that's where I draw the line. Now, Jesus' disciples, they're willing to listen to Jesus. They're following, following him after all. Here's their issue, though. The disciples were too distractive, too inattentive to see what, Je- what Jesus was doing. They were too distracted about dinner to stop and listen to Jesus and realize what Jesus had just done, what he had just said. So he asked him, do you not see, do you not hear, do you not understand? Do you see, do you hear, and do you understand? Now it's not fair to judge the disciples too harshly. For I am no better, for we are no better. I did sit and complain to God that he's not answering my prayers, that I couldn't see the work that he was doing in my life and the world around me. I had this prayer journal that I kept. I recorded my prayer, prayer requests and the answer to these prayers. And that day when I was complaining to him, I remember somebody said once, instead of complaining, why don't you just pray and bring all these uh, questions and complaints to him. So I remembered I had this journal, I opened it up, and I start listing through the pages trying to see where the last page was that I stopped at. And as I was Turning each page, it dawned on me, maybe I should read through the requests and see all the answered prayers to see his work. So I began to read through. I saw the answered prayers. Some of them were answered exactly as I asked. Some of them had answers that I didn't necessarily like. And some of them were still unanswered. But one thing I did see that day is that he was working in my life. But I was just too distracted by all the worries, by all the things around to see it. What distracts you from seeing his work in your life? Maybe you're distracted by too, too distracted by all the cares in your life. Maybe you're worried about tomorrow. Or maybe you're, and you can fill in the blank. Has anyone ever sat down and cried out to God and said, Lord, I don't see it. In my complaint, that was one of the major ones. I don't see it. More specifically, I don't see your love towards me. So I cried out to him. But the definition of my Seeing his love was a bit selfish because what I thought was his love was when he answered the exact prayer that I was asking, the exact request that I was asking for, and a lot of the times that request was very selfish. So I asked, Lord, show me. That was my cry. Lord, show me. So he did. He turned my gaze to something that's been there as a testimony of his love for over 2,000 years. It was the cross. He then turned my gaze to his word, 66 love letters to you and to me. 
In that, I was reminded of his grace, of his mercy, of his love towards me, and again of his death on the cross for my sins, for something I deserved. Then his defeat of death and my eternal life. So which one can you relate to today? The unwilling or the distracted? If we open our eyes to see and perceive, we will see his work. If we open our ears to hear, in this loud and chaotic world, if we sit down, find a place of silence, and listen to his still small voice, we'll hear him and we'll see it. And in turn, if we begin to take notice of these things, our faith will begin to grow as a result. But one thing you can always look at as a reminder of his work in this world, in us, and his love towards us, towards us, is the cross. And that's something that we have to do on a daily basis, because just like the disciples, we may forget just as quickly as we remember, as we remember of it, if not faster than the disciples. Let us pray.